stage. The, um, I, mean, I love the stories of when James Cook turned up. Actually, Abel Tasman was the first European in the history book to turn up. The first thing there was exchanged was a musket ball, tune, this case, had a guy, boom, killed him. So that was the first exchange. Uh, Tasman got such a fright, he shot through and didn't even get on land. Uh, the second exchange was another musket ball fired by one of the young sailors on Cook's ship. This would be in the late 17th, 1758, 1959. Um, I don't know my own history. Uh, but the warriors, because we were a stone age people, stuck, made of wood, stone, uh, they see someone fell from you know, 30 or 40 yards and it's like, gosh. What's that? How did we get that? What did that cost? How did you make that? Where did they come from? The musket trade was huge and it was huge very quick. And um, I love the idea of just not being scared even though people are dropping back around you because you want, you want the thing that's doing it. You want the two. It's called the two. Bang! It's dispensing the theft. You're a warrior. Suddenly the thing that you spend months carving and that is a piece of stone and a piece of wood. The white man's got the, he's got the tools. So I think we've always been challenged by what people were bringing in. But we had curiosity about it all. The idea that Māori, this is a little disjointed, the idea that Māori were, I warned you I go on tangent. I know, I'll give time too. So <laughs> uh, this is a, this is a uh, charcoal record. Uh, the idea that Māori were great environmental managers. Uh, we came from small islands, we ended up in a, in a large place with lots of flightless birds, so we just started dealing to the birds. Half of all the bird species that are extinct in New Zealand, a lot of them are dangerous, were extinct before Pākehā got there. And we have this record around about, so the Papa Papa goes back about a thousand, eight hundred years, a thousand years. And so we say we come from about a thousand years ago, and look, here's the spike and charcoal. So we were slashing and burning. Whether it was actually evil, whether it was in purpose, it's not something we focus on. Um, because many Māori, and myself included when I was younger, we bought into this romanticism that we were great environmental managers. So the park out, they're just terrible, you know, they don't know how to look after the land, but we know how to look after the land. So it's in our DNA. And I think that's a bit of a, you know, this is a, it starts just taking that into part a little bit. Again, the tool, this is a, a, a wood block cut. The plough, the first plough turned up in New Zealand 1820. Okay, so from Cook in the late 1770s, 1820, we're talking one generation. Here's a traditional core digging stick, the good, and there's a plow. Well, there's the chief. And then we ask him how much and what does he do with it. How do I start turning over the plan and here's the market? Because Mali actually started supplying the Auckland market with these crops, the Auckland's the main city, or the main city now, and it very quickly became a big city. Māori, particularly around Waikato, in the south of Auckland, were growing these crops. A lot of potato, wheat. The peach was very popular. Grapes were there early. Tobacco. Tobacco, I mean, half of all Māori women, <coughs> particularly, um, particularly our young women, we got some really bad uh, health care These are sort of some of the dates when they were first recorded, and again, their actual their, their origin. It's all around the world. And that's just a montage of, of some of the things that were going on during my PhD. I'm on the committee uh, for Tahui Whenua, the National Māori Vegetable Growers Collective. Tahui is to return to the land or to turn the land over. The picture there is of uh, the beak of a bird, but also the furrow of a cow. Here's uh, what we call Makariki, which the Japanese call Subaru, the Pleiades, the, uh, which we trust symbolizes the new year. It's actually the harvest time. It's, it's in the new school <coughs> winter, and, you know, it's not really a new year, but it's the time when you just harvest your crops and you sit around and eat. Talk about stuff. An old uh, auntie of mine, auntie, uh, Vicky Winnie Turner from Upper Lake, she married a man from Upper Lake, actually. She said she's she my auntie, that's cool. Uh, this is a variety of Kumpadina. Stuck sides, the little white flecks in the purple flesh, purple skin, the flesh is actually white. May, these are some schoolgirls from Kurakina, girls, uh, Māori Girls College, 
uh, not far from Massey University where, where these crops were growing. We cook in the honey is a the earth oven cook in the ground in the in the Pacific. Um, and the girls, you know, we, we used to be a rural uh, people, but these girls would have been up here and like, yeah, yeah, it's really smutty. You know, there's a mouse running around and it's cleaning on. But I mean they got down into it and, and they should, it worked really well. And at the end, um, they did some uh, some kapa haka for us and some of the action songs. And that was cool, that was cool check. But all of that got me thinking about, um, and because people were talking about the Somali economy. And we've had settlements with the government, and we've had land come back, and we've had uh, cash settlements, and we've had sort of an entree into um, corporate activity. Various things to Tiki Fenwa back in 93 to enable us to retain and use our land. To come to, it's very difficult to sell Māori land. Through education and through research, particularly through Wāmanga, which really boosted the numbers of Māori. So like a tribal college. Uh, there are three. There was a loophole in the legislation. And they shut it down, but um, you, could, you, know, you could start up a university or start up a college or start up a tertiary uh, institution. We call them Whare Wānanga, Houses of Learning, and there are three. Whare Wānanga is uh, Aotearoa, it's based in Kalamutu, but it has branches all around. Uh, Rokawa, which is just north of, a little north of Wellington, and Awanui Arangi in a place called Whakatāni uh, and Bay of Princess, which I visited uh, about a month ago, a very impressive place. So through these and through the Renaissance and through ongoing resistance and just through our breeding, uh, we, have a, we have a strong Māori presence in New Zealand. But I mentioned the neoliberal reforms, the 80s. New Zealand relies on the market to solve or cock up all sorts of problems. Um, I see New Zealand's presence as being quite vulnerable. I think Māori have a stronger presence in a less secure society. The recession is just exacerbated. I would have said the same thing 10 years ago. We have more capital, more planning. Planning power, however you want to call it, a little more money. Somehow, I don't have more money, but there's more money there attached to my economy. We've got more national land back, we're getting resources back. Through education and, and through better health and that, our human capital, which is an appalling term in some respects, but some of so much in others, it's improving, or at least not declining so much. We'll see how we come out of the recession. Social capital, like that's when people talk of social capital, the idea of networks, of organisations, bonding, uh, trust. Transfer. Certainly, we're engaged in more collaborative research and corporate activity around the world. Certainly, absolutely, it's an empirical fact. But we position ourselves as different and we draw a cultural boundary. And we think it's a very well defined boundary. The more you look into it, it's a very fuzzy boundary. But the idea of there being cultural capital and cultural resilience by that capital increasing. So the particular combination of these in a way that you would see as being particular to Māori, I mean, it's a, I think it's there, but I think we look into it, we're obliged to look into it, we're obliged to understand more about it. 